Do any of you remember the age before cell phones? Do you remember living through the lack of, I mean, I, you probably personally have experienced a lack of cell phone in your life, right? I know my, my, uh, 10 year old daughter yesterday when I was walking her to school, she, uh, she asked why she didn't have a cell phone, uh, which is a fair question because my 13 year old daughter got her first cell phone when she was nine, but the, the other daughter didn't seem like she wanted one that much, but before cell phones. So there was a transition period. Did anybody experience going through the transition period from the lack of cell phone to cell phone as a society? Anybody old enough to remember that? No, I remember it. One of the steps along, so we had the analog phones, which was really cool because you could literally go, yeah, you're breaking up. Yeah, 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 I can't and, and hang up the phone. And it was true that you might have walked to a place where the signal sounded like that. With digital phones, it breaks up. It's You can't do the staticky noise. And if you do the staticky noise, everybody, one, knows you're old, and two, knows that uh, you're faking it. Um, but one of the steps of that transition, and there's a segue to this lecture. These headphones are part of that segue, so don't let me put them down, earbuds, whatever we call these things now. Um, there was this step in the transition where it became possible to use a recording of a song as the ringtone on your phone. You guys all know that this exists. I experienced it coming into existence. Um, not quite as cool as having a child be born, but it was really pretty cool. And, and that and you could pick a different song for each person in your contact list, which was pretty cool too except the tendency was to pick songs you like. Is that true? And then there's caller ID too, built into the phones. So you'd look at the phone and say, I'd rather just listen to the song. <laughs> and so I had to make my ringtone just be normal. Um, I was thinking about that because uh, it was about time to start this lecture and I was listening to a song and I wasn't sure if I wanted to stop the song to start the lecture or not, but here we are. And I managed to use up the rest of the clock. So anybody that was waiting until the last second to log online or to get here, they didn't miss anything. Sorry about yesterday. Did anybody show up at the room or did everybody get the message? Don't be shy. Raise your hand if you showed up at the room. Oh, you did? Did you get the message after you showed up at the room? It's awkward when you walk in and there's nobody else there. And you wonder, how long should I wait? How long did you wait? Yeah. So um, there's like, uh, is there a rule about that? So if the professor doesn't show up to class, how long do you wait? <laughs> there is no rule. <laughs> All right, stop thinking there's a rule about it. If the professor doesn't show up to class and they didn't tell you in advance, you should be mad. You should be at the department office trying to find out where the hell they are, not waiting 10 minutes and then going home because you don't have class that day. Um, happened to me once. I forgot to go to class. I was the lab monitor. My face was there as the lab monitor. I was standing in the door to the lab where you could see as you walk by, you could see me talking to somebody. All of the students walked by there, went up to Washburn 229, sat in the class, waited the 10 minutes or 15 minutes, whatever they decided was the appropriate amount of time and then walked past me on the way out. None of them thought to come over and say, hey, you're supposed to be in class now. I knew what time class started. I just didn't know what time it was then. So I'm forgetful. Please come get me. Um, what, are we, uh, what are we talking about this week? Last time I checked the, uh, the video I posted for yesterday's lecture, which I spent hours editing together trying to find the best clips from all the times I've talked about this topic. Last time I checked, there was 12 views. Average watch duration, 10 minutes, which is pretty good because my average watch duration is about three minutes. So 10 minutes is pretty good, but it was 52 minutes long. Even at 2x speed, it takes longer than 10 minutes. What are we talking about this week? Okay. 
All right, can I advance the slide without starting the video? No, I can't. But now I can. Oh, we need audio. This doesn't work without audio. Hope there's not too much. We need more audio than that. What are we talking about this week? Modeling, right? You're gonna have to stop that. So why do we want to model anything? All right, so we might model something to see what it looks like. So we model something to see what it looks like. Why would we model something instead of just going out to look at it? Or we could see what it looks like by looking at it also, right? So why model it if we're modeling it to see what it looks like? Yes. So maybe it doesn't exist. So we could make it and then see what it looks like instead of modeling it, right? So still, why model it? Might. So we might want to save money. We might be doing it because we want to save the cost of making it because it doesn't exist and it not, right? It might not work. It doesn't exist. It might not work. We want to see it. So the model allows us to visualize something. Now, do we always see the thing? Do we always, so let's say we want to model the power plant for a Swedish submarine. So we want to model the power plant efficiency for a Swedish submarine. Now, the Swedish submarines use Stirling engines for their power plants. So you could model it using the Stirling cycle. Who's had thermo, right? So you model stuff in thermodynamics, right? But you don't see anything, do you? You don't actually see a submarine or even a model of a submarine, like our model of Camelot, right? So you don't see that. Let's see if I remember how this works. I do. Okay, so we, we see something, but we don't necessarily see the end result. Well, what do we see is we see a representation. So we want to see a representation of the thing that we're trying to understand. We do it because we want to understand. And what do we want to understand? We want to understand how it works, if it works, how to improve the way that it works, right? So when we're doing modeling, especially, so who typically does modeling? Yes. So, all right. So one of the things we call our SolidWorks files, we call them models. So when we're, creating we're creating the idea of our design we do it using software often that create a we call it a solid model which is really odd because it's nothing but ones and zeros right there's nothing solid about a solid model so we create a model and that gives us a visual representation but who so who does that who typically does solid modeling 
like if they got a job, if you wanted to get a job doing solid modeling, you'd have to find out who typically does that so you could apply for those jobs. Engineer. So engineers often do solid modeling. Or we used to, when I was in industry, we used to call these people CAD technicians. The engineer would have the idea. And we would sketch the idea on a piece of paper, a napkin from the bar where we had the idea, wherever it was. And we would give that sketch with sort of a list of ideas and thoughts about it to the CAD technician. They used to call them drafts people before that. I guess they were called draftsmen before we became politically correct. They called them people. Um, and then the drafts person or the CAD technician would create the representation and say, is this what you meant? And ask the engineer. Then you talk to him and then they'd figure it out. So when I came up as an engineer, engineers didn't have to do SolidWorks. Sucks to be you guys. They don't, I don't think they have a lot of CAD technicians anymore. Now you have to do it as an engineer. Oh, well. Um, all right. So, so engineers do solid modeling and that's to represent their idea of what they want to design to solve the customer's problem, right? Okay, what other kind of modeling would we do? If we were an engineer, if we were a manufacturer, what, what would we want to model besides just the representation of what we think we want to build? So a prototype is just an upgraded version of a model, right? So when we go out and we actually make the part, we may not use the same processes we would use in production and all those things. We talked about that uh, a couple weeks ago, but a prototype is an upgraded version of the model. It's often functional. It doesn't have to be functional. So that's another step in modeling, but it's really the same thing as the solid model. It's a, it's a physical representation of what we think it'll look like. I guess it shows function too. Uh, and you can, like they have moving solid models, right? I saw on Facebook last night, some guy posted, SolidWorks has posted up a thing about an, a steam engine and you can see all the components moving and all that stuff. Too bad you can't just press the print button and have it make a steam engine. Right, so, so what else would we model as an engineer besides just the shape of things? So we use mathematical modeling, just like in thermodynamics. So our Stirling engine, our Stirling cycle will model with math. And so we say, how much energy do I put in? How much energy is going to come out? That's typically what we care about in a thermodynamic analysis or in an analysis of an engine. So I, I'm going to put in this much energy. I'm going to get this much out. Some of it goes to waste. Some of it goes to heat. All that's, well, Stirling engines are all about heat and heat transfer. So there's that. All right. So we want to model. So now let's think as a manufacturing engineer. As manufacturing engineer, so we could model the, the functional performance of something. Right. So before I before I put a stiffer spring in the wastegate of the turbo in my Porsche, I may want to model how much power increase I'm going to get from that stiffer spring. Because I put the stiffer spring in the wastegate of the turbo. What's the risk? Explode. Right. Explosion is the risk. But hey, explosion versus 10 more horsepower at the wheels. I don't know. It might be worth the risk, depending on how fast you're trying to go down the um, residential street where you live. <laughs> so I, I, the street where I live is two lanes each direction. It's in the city. Speed limit's 30 miles an hour. But there is about a quarter mile straight away. And so many, many times I've had to call the police at two o'clock in the morning and say, hey, there's people drag racing in front of my house again. One, two, three, four, five high-speed collisions near my house. Wow. All of them in the middle of the night. Most of them drunk people. You can get going pretty fast and there's a rotary at the end and you gotta, it's hard to keep going in the right direction. Okay, um, so enough of that, uh, modeling, modeling. So as engineers, we can model the performance of something and that helps us decide, will this change help us meet our customer needs? As manufacturing engineers though, what do we wanna model? What's our customer need if we're a manufacturing engineer? They may want a prototype, right? 
But um, we talk, did we talk about quoting parts a little bit? We talked about the cost of making parts and how we want the cost of making parts to be a little bit less than the value of the part for the customer so that, well, it, actually we'd love it to be a lot less than the value. Um, <laughs> what said the, Never mind. I'm not gonna. Yeah, don't need to say that story right now. Um, but sometimes you underprice your parts because you don't consider the value, or the fact that they're going on million-dollar sailboats. Um, by the way, people that own boats love to spend money. So having boaters as your target market. Even my wife agrees that that's a good idea. As soon as I proposed it, in fact, she says, people that own boats love to spend money. She, I, I was her single data point at the time, but uh, it, was, it was true modeling. So as manufacturing engineers, what do we want to model? So we, we may care about modeling the performance because we may want to tell our designer friend that, hey, I can make your part, but it's not going to do what you want it to do because we've got some intuitive knowledge about the performance of what they asked for. But when our customers, manufacturing engineers, ask for a part, when they, even when they ask for a quote, what they really want is to have the part in their hand, right? So our customers want to have the part. If we're trying to do modeling to make our job better, make our stuff better, our stuff is going from idea to finished part, right? That's what we do. We take people's ideas and we turn them into finished parts as manufacturing engineers. So along that process, what would we want to model? Yeah. So we want to model processes. What processes do we know about in this class? Yes. We know about milling. What other process do we know about in this class? Yes. In turning. And both of these processes are chip, large chip formation. So material removal. by large chip formation. So both of these processes have some of the same fundamental physics where the cutting edge of the tool interacts with the workpiece. So that's kind of cool. We could use the same model for both processes. What's the other thing that makes, um, what, so you wanted the model to be cheaper than making the part, right? Somebody over here wanted the model to be cheaper than making the part. Otherwise you just make the part and observe how it works, right? If it's cheaper just to make the part, why bother modeling it? So what, um, what will typically make a model cheaper than doing the manufacturing? Yeah. Um, high volume. Well, so, yeah, so doing high volume, we usually are making the parts then. So when once we've decided how to make the parts, We'll want to make making the parts cheaper by increasing the sales throughput, increasing the volume. So yeah, I could automate without a model. I could think about how to. I guess well, as soon as I think about how to make it, I've started modeling, right? Because the concept of how I'm going to do the process in my head is really the kernel of a model. But um, but. If you discount that, I don't have to do any math to make, well, yeah, I'm gonna do math in my head anyway. But, but I don't have to do a lot of mathematical modeling to make the part if I can visualize how to make the part, right? So I can make the part and then I can start selling the part. And then if demand goes up, I may wanna introduce automation so that I can sell the part with less human interaction if I can sell them faster than I can make them, I'll want to reduce the human interaction as much as possible and, and automate as many of the steps as possible. But I don't need modeling necessarily to do that, although I'll probably use it. But so in our model, yeah. So make the model smaller. 
What else would I do to make the model cheaper? Use a different material. So we often do that with prototypes. We'll make the model like a scale model, um, especially if you're going to put it in a um, like a wind tunnel. So if you're testing performance and you have the, the body of your car you designed, you'll scale it down because it's really expensive to make a wind tunnel big enough to put a car in. Um, less expensive to make a smaller wind tunnel. So you'll scale it down. You may change the materials. But basically what you want to do is you want to simplify it, right? So you want to, you, and in order to simplify any process, because we're modeling a process now, you need to make some assumptions. So you can assume some things and, uh, and simplify your model. And so in both of these cases, our customer wants finished parts. We put into the parts raw material and processes, right? So we take raw material, we add the raw material to a process, out comes the finished part. If we think it in the most abstract sense. So, so material in, process, part. So that's the most abstract sense of how we're doing our manufacturing process or, or how we do manufacturing. So it's not just material that goes into the process though, is it? Material has to go into the process. What else has to go into the process? Energy. Well, I think we can, labor can be brought back to energy, right? Right, labor is, a transformation of energy into waste. I mean, yeah, and other stuff. Material plus energy goes into our process, part comes out. Because without the energy, material in, the, the same thing is gonna come out the other side, right? We have to do something to the part, so to do that. So um, what are the units for energy? So, I really hate this chalk. Joules. Did I spell that right? Close enough. You know what I mean, right? If I just put a big J, then it's joules, right? So, it's a joule, though, because that's pretty abstract. Can you break it into some other more fundamental units? So, there's kilograms in there. What else is in joules? You said meters per second. Come on. So kilograms. Oh, there it is. Look at that. I had it. I forgot you guys could see that one screen. Um, so kilograms, meters squared. Divided by second squared, which is well, that slide doesn't line up very well. So it's meters per second. All right, so energy is the ability to do work. Power is work over time. It's also current times voltage, right? So that's important to remember. It's also force times velocity. So power equals force times velocity. It equals current times voltage, and it's work divided by time. So how much time did it take to do the work? Yeah, let's skip through this. All right, the, so power is the rate at which work is applied. Um, especially in America here. Let me eat the solo of you here. Especially in America here, it's, it's interesting to do unit conversions. So watts, pretty easy. It's a joule per second. Horsepower is 33,000 
foot pounds per minute. So not only did we go minutes to seconds between the, the systems, we've got 33,000 foot pounds. Um, and so when you're doing these kind of calculations, when you're trying to understand the energy involved, um, make sure you don't screw up the units. Right, engineering's math, just a bunch of word problems, cancel the units. So power equals force times velocity. And all right, so yeah. These are the recap slides from yesterday's lecture. All right, so we wanna model this because our system requires raw materials and energy going in, we get a finished part on the outside. Would it be nice to know how much energy it's going to take before you start? Yeah. Um, why do you want to know how much energy it's going to take before you start? Or how much power it's going to take, right? So, so one reason you said you said one of the magic words, force, right? So energy or power is directly related to force times velocity, like because force times velocity equals power. If the power consumption is going to be huge, either we have to do it really fast or it's going to take a lot of force, right? What happens when the force exceeds the strength of the tool? Explosion. Um, or the force could exceed the ability of the fixture to hold the workpiece, which is delayed explosion. Because first it picks the workpiece up throws it across the machine tool, and then when it slams into the side. If you guys, next time you're in the lab, take a look at the side of mini mill number three as you walk by. You will see a dent about that shape. A little bit, not quite to scale, a little bit smaller than that. You'll see a dent about that shape pushing out from the inside of the machine. That's from a part that was fixtured incorrectly, and or cutting force was too much, take your pick, picked up out of the vise, thrown against the side of the machine. Good thing there was steel there. Uh, when we get to the fixturing and the safety lecture, I'll show you a really cool video. Um, all right, so it'd be nice to be able to, that mouse is not connected to this computer. It would be nice to be able to understand how much power it's gonna take to do something. So let's think of it. So if we're, we're going to model milling and turning, we're going to do it by modeling the force and the power at the cutting edge of the tool where the tool meets the workpiece is actually what we're going to care about for this. So what parameters, so if you are designing an experiment to find out what the equation is, so if you're developing the model in the first place, what do you think will impact the amount of power it takes to create the chip in the machining operation? Speed, speed of the tool. So, all right, so we say speed. And so that's the V, the velocity of the tool moving through the workpiece. So what are our typical units for speed? Could be meters per second, but what are our typical units for speed in this class? Could be inches per second. We often talk about RPM, feet per minute. So we, in manufacturing in the United States and machining in the United States, we talk about speed unless we specifically say RPM or rotations per minute, unless we specifically say that, you can assume that we mean feet per minute, and that's the speed, the velocity at which the cutting edge of the tool is moving through the workpiece material. And again, that depends on the diameter and um, the RPMs, right? Pi R, right? Pi R square, no, cake R square, pi R round. I told you guys about laughing at my jokes, right? 
right. Uh, all right. So the speed at which the, the velocity of the cutting edge through the workpiece, that's probably going to be important. What else do you think is going to be important? What are the factors we want to consider when we're making a model? So the material properties. So hardness is one of the important properties, but it's not just the hardness. Um, so just we'll group material properties into one thing. Yeah, often we call it machinability of the material. So as we get into this model, we will be drawing this picture. This is the tool. This is our workpiece. And so the workpiece is moving this direction, right? That's our V. Um, and somewhere here is where the workpiece becomes chip. And then the chip goes up here. The chip's moving that way. The workpiece is moving that way. The tool is right here. And so what we'll find out is that this tool, and you can model the interaction of the tool with the workpiece. You can model the interaction of the tool with the chip, right? Because as soon as it's gone past this plane right here, the chip is now its own thing. It's no longer part of the workpiece, even though somewhere here there's still physically attached, right? They transition from being workpiece to chip here. And so there's a force. So there's got to be some force the tool's putting in this direction, right? So we call that the cutting force because we're engineers. We're not that inventive for force names. Um, now, if that's the only thing acting on this, it, can it possibly be the only force acting? Move my velocity vector over here. So I've got a cutting force right there. This chip is sliding along the edge of the tool, right? So there's a friction happening right here as the chip slides along the edge of the tool. We know that that's happening. So that's trying to push the tool that way. So there's got to be a component trying to push the tool this way. But we don't like angles between our forces, do we? So some of that friction component adds to this FC in our model. And some of it goes in this direction. So in our orthogonal model here, FT, and then if you add those together, don't ask me why, FC and FT, they make sense, right? Cutting force, thrust force. So the thrust force is keeping the tool from flying away from the part. The cutting force is what's doing the cutting. And so this is the one that F times V equals power. Don't ask me why we use P, but all the literature uses P here. So our resultant force there is P. Um, now we'll see that we can break this P down into a force that lines up with that friction plane. Right, so if we care about the friction and we don't care so much about the power going to the spindle at this moment, then we can see that there's this angle and that friction force has got to be aligned with the angle of the tool, right? Because it's the, the chip sliding on the tool. And then, uh, and then we'll have a force normal to the friction force there. So we got a friction force and a force normal to the friction force. Those will also add together in order to make that resultant force P. Um, but the business of the chip formation, and so the where the material properties have the most impact is really happening along the shear plane right here. And so along the angle of that shear plane, there's also an orthogonal course, orthogonal force system that you could say 
We've got a shear force and the force normal. So the shear force is going to end here. All right, so we've got a shear force and a force normal to the shear force. And sorry, it's got to add to this shear force. I could just advance to the slide where I've actually calculated all the lengths of the vectors. Um, but so, yes, so we care about these forces. But let's take the step back. So we're going to get to this, this here. Let's take the step back to over here, though. If we just want to do an experiment and see how much power does it take for different materials, we're going to care about the material properties, the speed. What else do you think we care about? So are we going to care about the feed? We're going to care about the feed for a couple of different reasons. Um, one of the reasons and the primary reason that we care about the feed is because the feed combined with the depth of cut and the width of cut tells us our volumetric material removal rate. So... So if, if our feed units, what's our feed units? Um, length, so we'll just put them, well, we use inches. Inches per, inches per minute or inches per revolution, right? So we could talk about feed at either inches per minute or inches per revolution. There's the obvious transfer of uh, minutes to revolutions using RPM, right? So we can go back and forth. So inches per revolution, length per revolution, length per minute up here for our speed. So that feed times times so depth of cut times width of cut is inches cubed per revolution. And we call this we call it Q. Some math genius decided that Q represents volumetric material removal. Don't know why, but it's in all the literature as Q, so I'll, I'll be consistent. So we care about that feed because it's part of Q. It turns out we'll find that if you go to the uh, Machinery Sandbook, if you happen to have the 28th edition of the Machinery Sandbook, it is page 1054. Different editions are different page numbers. Pretty sure you could go all the way back to like the first or the second edition, maybe not quite that far back, but you can go pretty far back in editions and it'll be exactly the same words. I'm almost 100% certain that I think the current is the 31st edition almost 100% certain the 31st edition has the exact same words in the section that the 28th edition does. This is the slide that I made. I don't know, whenever they had the 28th edition was the most recent. Um, I was actually invited to be an editor of the 30th or the 29th edition. And I decided not to do it because it was going to be a lot of work. You can imagine editing, a, this book is you know, this thick and printed on Bible thick paper, right? So, so, you know, Bibles have the really thin paper so you can get a lot of words in a small volume. This book's got the same kind of paper and it's like this thick. So, um, oh, but you get it for free at the library. Go to the library website, search for Machinery's Handbook and then find the electronic version. You'll need to use that um, in the class here. Um, anyway, as you get into that, you'll see that the feed is also important because when they plotted all their data on their graph, they had some unexplained variation from the theory. And they saw that if they included a factor that was associated with the feed, that they could make that unexplained variation go away. You guys in the back that took thermo before, what do we call that? Would we make up a variable and add it to our equation to make the data fit better? Yeah, yeah, we call that a fudge factor. Fudging the data, I guess, right? You learned, to, learned how to do that in high school? High school physics class, chemistry class, you learned how to fudge the data? Yeah. Do you know that it never works? You never once fooled the 
the instructor because there's a normal variance in the data. And if you make up data points, you make up more perfect data points than what the normal variance would be. And every time if you plot the people's data, you can tell if it was faked or not. Maybe your high school teachers didn't care, but some of your teachers here will care. So don't fake the data. Um, all right, so besides the material removal rate, this feed factor that we're gonna need, the material properties, what else do you think is gonna be important in estimating how much power it's gonna to take to do the cut? Yeah. The quality of the tool. So we have a factor that we call the, uh, the tool wear factor, which I think we use W for. Um, the tool wear factor, it's really, it's a measure of how sharp the tool is. So a perfectly sharp tool, and perfect is kind of an odd word to use here, but a perfectly sharp tool would have a tool wear factor of one, would not impact the, the thing. And then as the tool gets dull, it will have more and more impact. Let's see what I got here. Um, and so this uh, specific power, it's critical, critical. So this is the one that's due to the material properties here. It is critical that you have the units figured out by the time you start looking these things up. So if some of your information is in metric units and some of your information is in um, imperial units, whatever we call these units, what do we call these units today? The ones we use here typically, besides stupid. Yeah, what, what is it? Is it imperial units? I, I usually call it like inch pound system because I'm never sure. Like, which empire is it? The empire of the United States? You know, there's three countries, unless something has changed, there's three countries that use this unit system. The grand empire of the United States, Sierra Leone, and Myanmar the country formerly known as Burma. And so Sierra Leone has been going through some revolution for the past 50 years. I could see why they haven't bothered to change their national system of units. Yeah. Not on official documents, they don't. They talk about it in conversation. And yeah, I, I, I lost two stone the other day. And me, I think you peed out two kidney stones into a cup, but, but no, two stone is like, was that like 20 pounds? Two stones a lot. You don't want to lose two stone at once. But um, yeah. But yeah, in official documents, it's all metric. But they do in conversation still, I think even use miles in conversation, but not on road signs. Really? I never bought gas in Britain. Yeah. It's weird. So there's, their system is as screwed up as ours. But make sure that you know which units you're using. Because you can see here, 0.25 is not the same as 0.68. Your answer will be wrong if you use the wrong one of those. But you can go through these calculations either with metric units or with SI units. Um, so this, I told you they had this feed factor. And so depending on how fast you're going, so if you're going really slow, the fact that you're going really slow will have more impact on the power. Actually, there's a minimum there's a minimum feed at which you can go, because there's a smallest chip that it's possible to make in every material, and so these feed factors factor in there. Um, material removal. So we always we often talk in uh, in CNC machining about putting chips in the bucket, right? Now the customer doesn't want the chips unless you're talking about the aluminum recycling company, but we love to put chips in buckets. And so our material removal, again, it's volume over time. And so in a milling operation, it's gonna be the feed in inches per revolution, the depth of cut, the width of cut. In a turning operation, you can figure that out too. Um, we've got tool wear factors. So sharp tools have a W of one. Less sharp tools have different Ws. And all right. How do you know what the tool wear factor is for your tool? I took the tool out of the box in the machine shop. How do I know what the tool wear factor is? You don't. You're gonna have to guess. 
You're going to have to make assumptions. If the power being higher would be bad for you, estimate a tool or factor that would make more power. If the power being low would be bad for you, estimate the tool wear factor that would make low power. And then you've got, a because again, we're estimating the power it takes to make the cut. If we want to know the power it takes to make the cut, we can measure the power it takes to make the cut. So this is an estimate. Um, all right, so power of the cut is that KP times C times Q times W. And so that's the power it takes. Let me move this over here. So that's the power it takes for the tool to move through the workpiece material. Now, raise your hand if you watched the video yesterday, at least through the first 10 minutes. So the rest of you should at least watch the first 10 minutes of the video because I'm not going to repeat that today. But when we watched those first 10 minutes of the video, one of the things we saw is we were observing a cutting operation happen and there's a power meter on the front of the machine tools that you guys are using and so you can watch the needle go up and down as the tool's cutting so we were observing the cutting operation while we were observing that needle and so the power that's measured at that needle one how do we measure that power at the needle yeah yeah so we measure the Oh, the amps, was amps times uh, amps times volts, is watts, right? We measure we measure the voltage, and we measure the amps going down the wire that's powering the motor that's spinning the spindle. So if we're measuring the amps to spinning the spindle, is that the same as the power that's at the cutting edge of the tool? No. So if we're going from the meter to the cutting edge of the tool, we've got an efficiency factor for how efficient is the machine tool at getting power from the spindle to the cutting edge, right? This is going to be losses in the bearings and the spindles and things like that. There's some energy that it takes just to keep the spindle spinning. Um, all right, so that's cool. So we can estimate the power to make a chip if we know something about the material, if we know our feed rate, if we know our material removal rate, hey, did you guys notice that this wasn't in there directly? Uh, what was KP? KP is our material, is our material machine ability numeric quantification. These KP values have come from hundreds of thousands of experiments that people did. So they took a tool and they cut a bunch of different materials with it. And they saw how much power did it take to do that. And they backed out these KP values so that you can go to the machinery's handbook, look up what's the KP value for plain carbon steel and know that it's in the range of 0.63 to 0.85, plug that into the equation and get an estimate for power without having to set up your machine and do the cut. So other people have sweated in the machine shop so that you can have this data. So speed is not directly in this equation, although it's a factor in Q, right? So how fast we're moving the cutting edge through the material is a factor in Q. So in our material removal. So it's there, it's just not directly seen. <clears throat> All right, let's take a look. Oh, it's almost time. Okay. There, we'll take a look fast. All right, so here's a cut. Well, that was a little bit too fast. Here's a cut. All right. And so the chip is forming on the rake face of the tool here. This is the rake face. That face is the plane that's coming in and out of the board in this figure. The, uh, the point here at the tip of the tool where the tool interacts with 
the workpiece material and the chip. That's as if you're sighted straight down that edge of the tool. Next slide, okay. This is, oh yeah, all right, come on. Oh, I thought that was the video. Well, there is a video there. All right, we'll end on this video today. We'll pick up here tomorrow. Uh, I owe you guys a quiz. I know that. I just realized this morning in reading emails that I had forgotten to turn on the quiz. So I decided I would take a look at it before I turned it on today. So I'll turn that quiz on. It won't be due tonight. That would be kind of rude on my part. Um, I'll make the, the quiz be due on Friday. Uh, but if for some reason you can't do it on Friday, submit the form. Don't use your oops. Just say it's the emergency one and state your emergency was that I'm slow at putting out the quiz, not that you had an emergency. Um, and we'll start on this tomorrow.